Hi, God bless you. I am back, and guess what? Um, I knew I was supposed to go ahead and tape this uh, today, and that is tonight. We're almost at midnight, but I need to record this CEU training because I took about maybe 15 minutes looking for my notes, and they were at the foot of my bed. <laughs> looking everywhere else and right at the foot of my bed. <laughs> so anyway, so I said, oh, well, yeah, I'm supposed to do this here. So I got me a little ice cream to kind of quicken me and waking me to wake me up. So because I really did not want to go to sleep without doing this, and then maybe – I didn't get to find it right away. But anyway, long story short, uh, for those that are just getting an opportunity to join us, we are at Component 4 for 2016 uh, for the CEU certification for those who are getting this free training. You definitely want this, you know, especially those that are churches. You need to get this and that are dealing with children. We're in a time right now, I know you can see the news every day. These poor babies are getting, you know, violated in so many ways, but, you know, this certification is free, and I pray that if you have not already gotten on the list to be sure and get your certification at the end of this free training, you do want to get a hold of me so that we can do that. Uh, be sure and watch the details at the end of the recording so that you can get, um, that is on this video recording, so that you can get the details to get the CEU certification. It's going to definitely uh, be a benefit for your ministry or your business, especially if you're dealing with children or teens, any type of mentoring programs, you definitely want to use the certification. And so we're going to talk tonight in our component number four of six components of preventing child sexual abuse within youth serving organizations or businesses of any type, whether they're faith-based or secular. And so we're preparing you tonight so you can start, you know, working on getting your policies and your procedures together so that you can have needless casualties of lawsuits because they are what, like I always say, and which is so true statistically, uh, the body of Christ is the number one population that is in the course today because they do not want to believe that the enemy sits on the pews, right, in the church house, and they know how to get in and look very blessed and highly favored and undercover uh, just abusers. So anyway, we're going to believe, God, that you're going to use these uh, nuggets I'm going to give today on component four, which is ensuring safe environments. It's so important for this component that you begin to look for ways to make sure your environment is safe. So our goal of this lesson today is to keep you from situations which they are in, well, well, that is, which they may be at risk uh, or at increased risk for sexual abuse. And so, and as I said, because the church is the number one uh, place where a lot of kids are being violated, uh, you want to make sure that you pass this on to your leader, especially, or your pastors who have uh, daycares inside of their churches so they can get an understanding about this particular component that is very critical for this last day. We've got to ensure safe environment. So the principle, the principle is simply that we've got to make sure that whether you are a, like I said, an organization, a daycare, um, whatever you want to call, just call yourself, nonprofit, grassroots, mentoring, church, um, whatever type of program that you're dealing with, we've got to listen to these strategies I'm going to be giving you in just a few minutes about uh, different ways to look at the physical site where you're hosting the care or the program, to look at whether or not you've got multiple sites and multiple activities going on at the same time, like particular games, sports, any type of recreations, things like that. And especially if you are leasing a building, that's very important to know because a lot of the rules and regulations for its policies are concerned for insurance. If you're leasing a building, that's a whole nother thing as far as uh, safety is concerned in the environment that you are hosting the event or that you are doing some type of daycare. So if your organization does not have control over its own space 
or it doesn't have backup strategies, you've got to find ways to monitor those who are volunteering and those who are on staff that are dealing with your population, especially if they're youth and teens. You're going to have to look at ways to kind of uh, make sure that you strategically uh, monitor those who are connected to these children, uh, especially if they're in a group or if they're having one-on-one with this youth or this child. And so I want to give you some, let's see, I think I have, let me see how many I have here. I think I have about five uh, critical strategies for ensuring safe environments that I want to give you. And so the first strategy we want to have is visibility. That's very, very important because if you are building or choosing these spaces that are open and visible, uh, you need to do that. That's wisdom, especially if you're going to have multiple people in this environment where these children are. It could be very risky. It could be very tempting for an abuser, especially if the behavior for some of these kids as I talked about in my last taping uh, about some of the behaviors that these kids can very, very um, – you know, be very, very provocative because what they've learned at home are being abused that they may have never told anybody. And so building these spaces and these environments uh, and these multiple type of uh, recreational spaces, uh, you want to create this environment that is wide open and where it is safe. So it needs to be visible where you can, how to say, where you can look from one part of the room to the next and be able to see. So you want to use some of these methods to increase the visibility. This is number one. You want to landscape, that is to ensure that the open visible spaces, they have no possible uh, no possibility at all of concealment. That's very important to know. So you want to write these down and you want to consider these in your policies to make sure that as you begin to create the space or the environment before you even uh, bring these programs, I'm sorry, these uh, type of um I guess you want to talk environments where you're going to be hosting, whether it's a sleeping area or whether it's an area where they're going to be eating or having a recreation. You've got to make sure that the landscape or the actual layout, you're going to ensure that the spaces um, will be very, very visible and there's no concealment. Then the second thing you want to do for the strategy in that is you want to have clear lines of sight throughout the building. So that means wherever you are, when you enter the building, you might have to have the walls where there's windows or whatever within, so someone can always be peeking into a window or they can look through a door and see what is going on. And then you want to secure areas not used for program purposes. This way you can prevent the youth from being isolated or locked in into specific rooms or store rooms. So you want to secure those areas that are not being used uh, to prevent these kids from getting isolated or finding themselves locking themselves in places to, you know, to kind of hide away from someone because they're angry or whatever. This will really, really decrease in lawsuits for these kids getting locked in or they can say, I got locked in, and then there you go with a lawsuit. And then you want to have, uh, you want to install windows indoors. Remember, I just got done saying that. You want to make sure those windows are indoors that you can see around and through. Um, and then you want to um, institute a no closed door policy. Very important because a lot of times people want to take kids behind closed doors and say, I want to talk to them by themselves, and you don't know what is going on in that room, uh, you know, so because it don't take but a snap of a finger to have someone uh, take their finger and put it somewhere it has no business or have a child touch them in a place they have no business or them touching and hugging them or kissing them on their neck and so on. So you want to have a no closed door policy. And then, again, the next thing in regards to visibility, you want to install bright lighting in all areas. And so, therefore, when lights are on or lights are off, you will have lights maybe they may, may be peeking in during nap time if you have a daycare or whatever where you have this uh, visible type of way of seeing so that the light can shine on a dark place while the kids are still being comfortable. So you want to have an uh, bright lighting in all areas type of policy. So that means, of course, kids can't 
nap in bright light. But you want to be able to have a light in an area where the light can shine bright, where you can see, because like I said on the last taping that I gave, is that we have a lot of kids that are funding other kids and showing their private parts to other kids because these things are being done to them. And so you want to make sure you be able to have visibility to see all these things so that there will, there won't be lawsuits. And then the next strategy for this critical uh, need to ensure uh, environmental safety is privacy when toileting, I'm sorry, when, yeah, toileting <laughs> and showering and changing clothes. Now, a lot of the kids that are going to camps today, a lot of them are somewhat, um, you know how they group in this big old shower area and they have these stalls but they have no doors. And so you got to be very, very careful for those that are taking kids out on camp sites or uh, doing uh, organizations or developing programs where they're going to have ranches and things like that. When some of these spaces now are developed where uh, there are no doors, but at the same time, uh, there are some that have doors, but they can still maybe see the top of their body and maybe not the bottom. I don't know. But I know that when we're coming up in gym time, uh, where we're all coming out of gym or whatever, all you got to think about how it was with us. We had brick stalls, but there were no doors. And we took showers, and everybody could see all of your parts as a girl. Same thing probably in the bars. I don't know. But I do know that your organization or your ministry should develop policies and procedures for reducing these risks that people are coming into, maybe campsites where they're showering or whatever, uh, during these activities when they're toilet, using the toilet or they're changing clothes. Uh, this will prevent a whole lot of risk of both employee, volunteer, or, you know, this type of sexual abuse to go on. But it will also it will also cause us to be at risk for inappropriate harmful contact with youth to youth. And so you got to make sure you look at writing your policies to make sure you include in that policy in regards to toileting, showering, and changing clothes. Very important, especially, you know, even when people have kids go over to spend the night. That's one of the things I'm very cautious about with my grandkids. You know, when they spend the night and these women got boyfriends and things like that and they acting like they stepping in and, oh, I didn't know you was in there. And all the time they really are coming in to try to test them out to see if they can funnel them or try to uh, have sex with these poor babies. So you've got to make sure you watch what you're doing and as you're developing these policies, you need to be setting some ground rules in your family as well to to make sure as regards to going to the bathroom, showering, and changing clothes that no one enters the door uh, without knocking and or having permission to come in that room. It's very important. And then the other critical area is number three, which is the access control. As I said earlier on, uh, access is very important because a lot of people think, oh, I'm your niece, or, oh, I'm your cousin, or, I'm your daddy. What are you talking about? I can't come in this bathroom. You know, but we got to make sure that we understand because sometimes people that have family operating businesses and they have uncles and cousins and many of them have been molested right in their own church houses or in their own homes because of the access, the lack of control of access. And so your organization or your ministry or business should monitor who is present at all times because so many people have allowed people to have access to their children, not filling out the right prop proper paperwork and so on, so your organization needs to develop a policy and a procedure for admitting and releasing their child so, you know, wherever they are going to be going or whatever, or whoever's going to be picking them up, uh, these policies and procedures need to be in place. And I'll stop right there so I can make sure that when you release a youth to somebody, you need to make sure you have that particular document in place. Uh, whenever we have our youth programs, we want to find out who's picking them up, when they're going to be picked up, 
And uh, if the mama dropped them off, then just because the mama's name on there for dropping off and picking up, if somebody is different, if it's the daddy, then we need to make sure that the mama put an alternate name on there because we're not going to let them go with the daddy. And I'm going to tell you why. I remember um, a few years ago a friend of mine had told me that, well, it's not not a few, it's quite a while now because um, she has just, I mean, her child has uh, been gone to glory for a long time. But the father pick the child up from the daycare and because they were going through a divorce now these are these are people that are a church going five baptized you know speaking in tongues people they get in a, a violent altercation uh she goes to work and then head home to I mean, head to the daycare to pick the child up she gets a call from him and telling him that I've got the child and you won't get him, which was his own blood child, you know, uh, blood relative. That means his child, his son, picked him up from the daycare, took him out to a field and beat him to death. Beat the child to death because she was divorcing him. Really, really sad story. And so what she learned from that now is that she understood that in order for her child to be in the hands of anyone, though his name was on the paper to pick the child up, we've got to make sure that we follow procedures, especially legally, when you know you're going through a divorce or anything like that, these kids are at risk. So you need to make sure if you're having a daycare or whatever, you need to take some of those tips I just gave you and make sure you have to pick up and drop off and alternates and so on and IDs and pictures and everything else because people will come in and say that's who they are and you may not have even seen them or you may have a substitute or wherever that is there and they'll say, oh, this is their uncle, oh, this is their daddy. And the kids may know them and they're not they're not going to say, I'm not going with that person. You know, they're going to go, yeah, yeah, because if they're too little, they can't say. But you've got to know that we're responsible for the safety of these who are being, you know, admitted and being picked up from those that, you know, from those areas that we have um, provided for them to be picked up at and as well as uh, provide the access. And so it's very important. So she learned to make sure that uh, she go back and take off names, especially when there's no more relationship or whatever. And I hope that if any woman listens to this, uh, you, need to, you need to probably email it to somebody who may be going through a divorce or whatever and have children, that they need to take the names off of there, especially even the father. You know, take those off if they don't have any right communication. They need to take those names off when there's a lot of anger and, and you know, children are being treated like male back and forth or using the kids as, you know, just uh, weapons to get back at the spouses. So you need to make sure that names are taken off so that, you know, they won't have this easy access to these children because these kids are getting beat and abused terribly because they're mad at the spouse or the girlfriend. And then the next thing in this access control, you want to have policy and procedures for monitoring which people outside of your organization or your business are allowed. That means that who is outside, what other organizations outside that says that we're picking them up, this needs to be legitimate, this needs to be in writing, if they're picking them up, whether it's a field trip or whatever. And so you want to look at for what circumstances are the people inside even have a right to take them from one part of your organization of business into another part of your organization of business. And that example is if they're in the play area where all the, you know, say they're playing gangs in one room where all the gangs are and things like that in one room. And then on the other side of the wall is where there may be uh, the kids may sit down and have lunch or whatever, and they may take them in that area and claim they want to talk to them alone. It's it just because they work there and they're on staff or they're volunteering. No, you got to make sure that you secure that uh, opportunity for anybody to come in uh, as will and have access uh, to that area where that child is for whatever reason. And a lot of times uh, people take advantage when they know these kids have been sexually uh, molested or whatever, and they figure they're out of their mind. They're not going to be able to tell the difference, so they figure they'll just blame it on somebody else because they'll threaten them real good. So, you know, we're 
accountable to that to make sure we watch what we share about these children and their past histories and things like that because a lot of times these kids become just prey to those who know that these kids have been abused and so they use that opportunity to be able to say they're lying on them and so it will be that child's word against them when all they've done is funnel them and there's no cameras, nothing else to be able to see what's going on. So you've got to make sure that you lock down and write the policy and make it plain and clear about the accessibility, whether it's in-house or outside of the business or organization. And then the off-site activity guidelines. You know, uh, your organization should define clearly in your policy and procedures, you know, and communicate its on-site and off-site physical boundaries. That's very important, those physical boundaries. Everybody should not be able to walk in off the street and come in a specific area. And so the off-site activity guidelines, you've got to decide and communicate when and where your organization is going to be responsible for the youth or the teen that it's going to serve. And so you also need to be particular about what you're going to say in that policy and make sure that it is very key as far as multi-organizations or other facilities that are involved where you're going to be having them go, especially on field trips. And then you want to develop an environmental policy for field trips and off-site activities, such as, for example, you want to uh, show how to handle the off-site bathroom breaks. You want to discuss in that policy, policy how to use the public transportation so that it won't be any type of uh, casualty as it relates to kids getting on wrong buses or going to the bathroom and staying too long and then the leader or whomever had to walk off and go get another child. You've got to work on that off-site activity guideline. And then number five, the transportation policy, as I mentioned earlier. Your organization or your business, your daycare Whatever title you want to give it when you're dealing with these kids or these teens, you have got to define who's going to be responsible for transporting these kids or these youths to and fro from these different different activities, whether it's something that y'all doing every week or whether it's something that you have a particular activity about or any special trips, like I said, field trips, overnight trips, whatever it is. You've got to decide in this transportation policy that you're going to write you got to decide how you're going to have these particular questions answered. The first one you want to find out is when is your organization responsible for the transportation? That's number one. When are you going to be responsible? So you'll know up front what you're responsible about as it relates to tra- transporting a child or a team. And then you want to answer the question, when are caregivers, caregivers responsible? So when are those people who are actually responsible in my business or my organization, when are they responsible as far as transportation policies are concerned? And then you want to ask the next question is, can that child or that teen ride in a car? with an employee or volunteer. That's very important because when my uh, team, my, I just finished the, the uh, mentoring program for my girls, um, I made sure that I documented everything uh, we had. For an example, they got the release. Uh, we got the release from the parents to say that they can ride in my car, okay? When we got to go to get our uh, lunch break, I had to then contact or have the child text the parent because the other parent said that they're going to be leaving at a certain hour and that they could take the other child home. This is one of the scenarios that always happen. Maybe an accident could happen or maybe the child may get sick in, in, in the transportation, you know, where they're taking them home or on the way or whatever, and, and I've given permission for the child to ride, and the parent haven't given me permission to release them to that other person. See, you can't just say, oh, yeah, let them go ahead and ride with them, when they've been only signed off to ride in your vehicle or on your van. So you got to make sure that you can get the authorized permission from the legal guardian or parent 
uh, you know, that they can ride in the vehicle or van with another employee or a volunteer. And, yes, if they are going to allow that, you need to make sure under what circumstances. For example, can they be alone with this person in the car? See, you know, they might say, well, he's going the same way, or he's with our group. No, he, 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 you know, that mother may not even want her child in the same vehicle with a man. So we've got to make sure that those things are signed off, you know, and, and and making sure because the parents like, you called me for that when I told you, yeah, yeah we, I called you for that because your child was only signed off to ride with me. Now, I need to, you to text me that it is your permission that your child can get in the car with this parent and go home from here. And so she texts me the yes and my permission and today and, you know, my name I give Dr. Murphy's permission. That's all I needed to have something to legally, you know, have me protected because anything can happen. Like I said early on, a wreck or something could easily happen or something could be said to the child that devastate the child. You know, you've got to make sure that you understand that this transportation policy goes beyond just a ride. And then the next thing on the transportation policy you want to ask the question is, what are pickup procedures at the end of the day or the event? And so you got to have that written very plain and clear. What procedures in regards to picking up and dropping off at the end of the day or the event? My policy that I have, if the kids are not picked up by this hour, which we our program was over at 3, if they were not there within 30 minutes, they would charge a certain amount of money Every 30 minutes they were going to pay. Why? Because by the time at the end of a program, parents want to use you now as an end-of-day daycare. So I made sure that they knew if you're not here at this hour, you owe this much every 30 minutes. Not every hour, every 30 minutes you owe this X amount of dollars. And if you don't pay up when you get there, the child cannot come back until you pay. Because now I have to extend my day or either I have to get some other staff member to stay there with them because the procedures that the parent didn't follow caused us to extend our day. And so you want to make sure that you have in your policy and your procedures, whether you're doing an event or whether you have a continuous program or a daycare, you want to make sure that you have your pickup procedures that at the end of the day or the end of the event, what that time is, what you are going to decide is within your policies, and you heard mine, that you want to pay. And trust me, it works because they do not want to pay. They want to, they'll be there on a the dime because they already know they want them in the program and they don't want to spend no money because my programs are free. But when it comes to you going beyond my policy and my timeline, you're going to pay. And so it's up to you. Now, and then our final um uh, particular component, I mean, particular strategy for this uh, component is going to uh, give you some more additional considerations uh, for, for to make some strategic policies as far as as far as uh, the area where you are serving, as far as monitoring devices. So the first thing I want to give you is this additional uh, consideration is the territorial. A responsibility and the reason why you need this particular strategy is so that everything as relations to territorial uh, strategy this sends a visual message that your program is unified it sends a visual message that your program is cohesive and it's not one that is what you want to call um, I guess at risk or will cause a threat. And so this territorial type of consideration in your policy uh, will be able to make sure that you're able to navigate what's going to happen from the time that child gets there until they leave. And so some examples of this strategy can easily include, like like I said, ways to make it easy uh, to find out who's going to sign in and sign out, as I described earlier, earlier on, um, and some other things that may cause you to overstate or misrepresent or mis uh, miscommunicate, uh, I guess you'd like to say, of uh, the appearance 
of what some kids may uh, get familiar with doing with an adult versus uh, maybe a volunteer. And so this um, uh, type of policy will also make you be very careful uh, about even overstating the appearance of the staff, you know, with uniforms or similar clothing. So you want to be very, very careful that you look at uh, how you're going to have this type of territorial, visual type of message that you're putting out there as it relates to, um, like I said, the uniforms or the clothing that uh, the staff or the child may be wearing that may be similar uh, you got to look at those to see whether or not they're going to be just a blanket uniform, uh, something that you know that can be strategically done so that everybody would be, like a lot of kids today, they're just sizing it up. Everybody got to wear blue and cream top or whatever khaki pants. You just got to look at how you're going to make this with like a territorial type of uh, navigation to make sure everything is flowing smoothly and everybody's cooperating as far as making sure that uh, we're all unified in this type, you know, in this type of program. And then the last one for consideration in this strategic type of uh, component is to make sure that you have some monitoring devices. You know, we're in time right now, we need to call it what it is. You know, it used to be a time we could put our kids in a room and be glad that they're in there with the teachers and all that. But because it's it's not that way anymore, you got to look at the fact that video cameras are going to be a need. Uh, you're going to need to take uh, some uh, financial um, seeds and sow into that uh, video camera because there's so many things that uh, could happen, you know, as far as the infrastructure of the building, as far as, you know, making sure that the staff that's behind these monitoring devices are those that you've done background checks on and things like that, that you feel comfortable that they are monitoring and they are watching them and that is and not sleep, you know, because some of these devices may easily get shut off and someone didn't have to look at it and monitor it occasionally and make sure that they are operating and that nobody has shut them off. And so if you install these devices, you've got to be sure to provide the infrastructure that will uphold that particular promise. So that means you want to make sure that the building outside and in will meet the qualifications of the devices. So you need to make sure you get a camera. You need to make sure you install them, and especially where the kids are napping, especially in the areas where these kids may have a space that could be where it is, uh, like I said, where it's kind of sized off where you can't see as well because a lot of you may not want to restructure your daycare. Money, a lot of you may not want to do it the way I've just described, but it's going to be up to you. Me, myself, if I was able to afford it for the, to ensure safety for those that God has put in my hand, I would definitely look into some type of monitoring Device. Well, that's all I have for you. I pray that you've been blessed by this. Please pass it on, especially to those that have daycares and those that are dealing with these teens and those that are dealing with these children. Because we're in a time, as I said before, there's a lot of inappropriate behavior that's going on. So um, that's it. Look for Component 5. We'll be talking about responding to this inappropriate behavior, um, how many times that these policies have been breached by the very people that we've hired and trusted, and a lot of allegations and suspicions about sexual, sexual abuse with children. We're going to be talking about that in uh, Component 5. Please pass this on and make sure you let me know that you that you cover each component, and I am going to need your uh, contact information to make sure, because we will have like a, a refresher, uh, probably a little quiz over everything, especially since these are videos and not playbacks. Take care. Hope you've been blessed.